Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to today's service of worship. I would encourage you, if you have a prayer request, to take a moment and fill out a prayer slip during the announcements this morning. And I was watching as people came in, and um, I saw Phil scurrying around, making sure that everybody had communion elements. Uh, we are celebrating communion this morning. If you did not <clears throat> have a chance to pick up elements on the way in, uh, why don't you just kind of stick up a hand at this point and uh, Phil or Susie will make sure that you have them. It looks like we're all covered. I'd like to just say a few thank yous for the folks who are leading this morning. Uh, Lance Schaefer is our liturgist. Kathleen Schaefer and Ann Badger are leading us in music today. And Dan Montague and Taylor Went are in the AV booth. There's an announcement in the bulletin about Meals on Wheels. Uh, the schedule is getting pretty close to being full, but there still are some open dates in the Meals on Wheels schedule. Uh, we're doing Meals on Wheels beginning June 21st, running through the 2nd of July. If you are able to help, uh, please uh, see Betty Russell, and Betty will see if there's a place to put you in the schedule. As we come together to worship the Lord and come to the Lord's table, let's still ourselves in the presence of the Lord, opening ourselves to the work of the Spirit of the living God. Let us worship the Lord together. Please uh, stand, if able, and join me in the call to worship this morning. We give you thanks, O Lord, with our whole hearts. We, we give, give thanks, thanks for your steadfast love and faithfulness. O God, we call on you, for you will increase our strength of soul. Though we walk in the midst of troubling times, you will stretch out your hand to us. So we gather to worship God, trusting in God's goodness and guidance. We come to offer our prayers and praise, seeking God's renewing love day by day. Please join me in prayer this morning. Our Lord God, Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, on this glorious Sunday morning, your divine communion is our refuge, our shelter, our life source. Abiding in your holy communion is where we are changed, transported from our views to your views, moved from our ways to your ways. From blindness to new sight, from hiding to dancing, from darkness to light. Given eyes to see and ears to hear and hands to do and feet to go. Abiding in your holy communion is where we relax with a deep sigh and release. Abiding in your holy communion is where the gifts of God are open and we glimpse your kingdom come, where acceptance, courtesy, and gentleness are esteemed, where we are given courage and extend to others encouragement, where healing is found as if we are suspended in place and time, where creativity thrives, where love is poured out, where prayer lives, where stillness flows, and where peace dwells. Thanks be to you, O God, for your sweet communion, our greatest delight. 
Amen. If God kept track of us sins, <clears throat> who would stand a chance? But with God, there is forgiveness. May God hear our request for mercy. God of purpose and possibility, you give us work to do and the skills we need to accomplish your call. Yet we prefer to follow our own ways. We resist your wisdom and fail to consider the suggestions of others. We think we know better. Forgive our stubborn nature and our unwillingness to reconsider our own views. By the power of your Holy Spirit and the grace of Christ our Lord, give us a teachable spirit to learn new ways to serve you and live as good neighbors in church and community. Amen. Brothers and sisters, do not lose heart. 
we are being renewed day by day through the grace of Christ extended to us. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Before we pray, one little thing that caught my eye as we were praying the prayer of confession. I sourced this week's prayer of confession from the, United, from the Presbyterian Church in Canada. And in the bulletin's version, I see that I did not completely translate the spelling into American spellings. And so um, I, am, I am grateful for uh, the uh, Presbyterian Church of Canada for providing that prayer for us today. Let's pray together. We praise you, Lord, for your steadfast love and faithfulness, that you are a very present help in times of trouble. We praise you, God of mountaintops and valleys, that you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. We thank you for the blessings of this week, for gifts of music and art, for things we have encountered this week that have caused us to smile and laugh. We thank you for shade trees and air conditioning, for young people graduating, And we pray, Lord, for healing, where healing is needed in our lives and in the lives of those we love. We pray for those who struggle with depression and anxiety, for those who live day to day with disabilities of mind or body, We pray especially for those who feel stuck in their lives, mired in places in which they can't find a way out, that you will come to them and renew them in hope. We pray with thanksgiving for those who write hymns and liturgies, for all the artists who Fill our worship and our spaces that we might seek in some small way to give you thanks and praise. We're thankful today for COVID progress, for more things opening up and new opportunities, and continue to pray for places in the world where vaccines have not arrived and COVID continues to spread and take lives. We pray for those in our world who are asylum seekers, who are caught in between, forced to leave where they are and struggling to find a safe place to arrive. We pray for those who seek to guide programs and policy, who's trying to find that balance between compassion and practicality. We pray that you would have mercy on us all and lead us in the ways of Jesus Christ, 
We offer our prayers in his name as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our uh, first scripture lesson this morning is from 2 Corinthians. And we're starting at chapter 4, verse 13, but continuing all the way through the first verse in chapter 5. In this passage this morning, the, Apo the Apostle Paul is explaining how the priceless treasure of knowing God's glory through faith in Christ is kept in the fragile containers of human beings. If you're interested in following along during the reading, I encourage you to turn to page 1798 in the Pew Bible. Hear now God's word to us this morning. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieved for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but, it, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Listen now to the 130th Psalm. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Let's pray. Lord, as we call out to you, renew us with your healing word. Amen. For the next few weeks, I'll be preaching from the book of Psalms. The Psalms are Israel's hymn book. To use the current jargon, the book of Psalms is a carefully curated collection of the praise and prayer of God's people. There are a number of reasons to think that this collection isn't just a random pile of poems that someone copied onto a scroll. For one thing, the fact that there are exactly 150 of them is a suspiciously round number for something that was just thrown together. 
And when we read our English versions, we find that many of the Psalms have headings that were part of the original Hebrew text that show the touch of an editor's hand. Things like a mass kill of David or musical instructions like to the reader according to the dove on far off terebinths. If the rabbis were anything like Presbyterians, I can imagine a rabbinical commission on liturgical song that argued late into the night over which psalms would make the final cut. It speaks volumes about the faith of ancient Israel and the work of the Holy Spirit that no matter how, ex no matter how exactly it happened, we have been given this particular collection. It's a remarkably broad witness to the experience of faith in God, which is something we might miss if we don't open the Psalter on a regular basis. Because as a whole, the book of Psalms gives us a very unvarnished picture of the life of faith, from the heights to the depths. It includes glorious hymns of praise and prayers of deep penitence, along with cries of self-pity and outbursts of burning anger. Today, we've read Psalm 130, another sign of the careful editing of the Book of Psalms is that this one is labeled a Song of Ascents. It's part of a collection of Psalms from 120 to 134 that are pilgrimage songs to be sung on the way up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. It's also one of the Bible's classic prayers of penitence, like Psalm 51. Remembering how we read last week of Isaiah seeing a vision of the Lord in the temple, it's easy to imagine that going to the temple where it was believed the glory of the Lord dwelt would make anyone profoundly aware of his or her unworthiness before God. Psalm 130 is the prayer of someone mired in the depths of sin. On the calendar of the Methodist Church, May 24th is known as Aldersgate Day. On that date in 1738, the young Anglican preacher John Wesley found himself in the depths. Full of zeal and commitment, he had gone to America as an evangelist. But when his message failed to touch lives, he began to doubt his own faith in God. Back in London on that day in 1738, he went to a midday service where Psalm 130 was sung. It spoke to him so deeply about his own experience that he quoted it in its entirety in his journal for that day. And that evening in a gathering on Aldersgate Street, he was listening to a reading from Martin Luther when, as he writes, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. The rest, as they say, is Methodist history. Psalm 130 is the testimony of a person mired in the depths of sin, waiting for a word of assurance from God but the experience of crying to God from the depths has other dimensions as well. In some cases, they may be depths of our own making. One bad decision leads to another until we have dug a hole for ourselves too deep to climb out. But many times we find ourselves in the depths for reasons beyond our control. 
There's something in the psalmist's cry and his sense of unworthiness that may resonate with the experience of those who suffer from depression. It's an experience some who are here this morning know personally. These are the words of a woman named Mary. For me, depression came with the winter, though warning signs could be felt and seen much sooner. A born and bred Southern girl, I'd gotten married, started a new job, and moved across the country to Minnesota all within two weeks, and just in time for the cold. I was tired, really tired. I was edgy and emotional and anxious. I began noticing that I felt exactly like it looked outside, gray and miserable, numb. I sank further and further until finally breaking down one day at a work conference. I could not go through the motions anymore. I felt like I was dying inside. I am a Christian, but depression tempted me to distrust God. I was desperately seeking deliverance. He seemed to be withholding it from me. Why will you not lift me out of this pit? I'd cry. Are you not a deliverer? Why do the voices of despair sound so much louder than yours? Others find themselves in the depths in different ways. Listen to this story of a man named Michael. Michael has been in U.S. immigration detention since August 2019. The only crime he has committed is seeking political asylum in the United States, with a certainty that if he returns to his home country of Kenya, he will be killed. Michael was a member of the current ruling political party in his homeland. He witnessed corruption and bribery by top government officials, which he reported to authorities. He did so out of his deep Christian conviction and a belief in law and order. Two other primary witnesses in the case were killed, and Michael was arrested, taken into custody, and tortured for three days. While later on a business trip to Singapore, Michael received a message that he should not return home because he would be killed. And out of fear, he did not board his flight to Nairobi. The driver who was to pick him up at the Nairobi airport did not know this, and so went to the airport as planned. The driver was gunned down as he drove away from the Nairobi airport without Michael. After a more than a year in immigration detention, which is a fancy word for prison, a U.S. immigration judge recently ruled that Michael is not eligible for political asylum because his torturers are member of the same political party as him. Psalm 130 is the prayer of someone in the depths. It isn't the testimony of someone who has been delivered from those depths yet. It doesn't take us all the way to the end of the story, which is where we live a great deal of the time. As such, it is a testimony to faith of the sort described in Hebrews 11 as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. It's the faith we see in Paul when he writes, so we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. This is the prayer of someone struggling through a sleepless night, plunged into the darkness of a spiritual and emotional pit. It's the prayer of a mother sitting beside a child's bed praying for a fever to break. 
of a husband in a hospital waiting room, waiting for the surgeon to come out with a report. The prayer of a person unjustly incarcerated and sitting on death row, waiting to be exonerated. Waiting in the confident hope that morning will come. It's faith that even from the depths overflows into words of encouragement to others. As the psalmist says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord is for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. This may seem like an extraordinary faith beyond our reach, but it speaks with the voice of someone who has been there and who knows, who says, keep waiting through the long dark night. Keep looking to the dawn. It will come. I think of how hollow words like this can sound when you're the one who's in the depths. And at those times, I'm reminded of the story of Job, who loses everything, wealth and home and children, and then his health. He's the epitome of a person in the depths. As he sits on the ground, his friends come along and it says they sat with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. If you know the book of Job, it was the smartest thing they ever did. When they begin to speak, they go on for 30 or so long-winded chapters, that hardly anyone ever reads. Sometimes just waiting together through the long night is the best thing we can do. But we wait and hope more than those who watch for the morning. The Lord's table is a place of waiting together where we remember that our Savior Jesus knows the darkness of the cross and the grave. Here with those who love us, he nurtures our faith as we wait for the morning. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Oh,
While we're here at the Lord's table, I would invite you to take your masks off. Although for a variety of reasons, we have surrounded the Lord's Supper with a set of rituals and practices and ceremonies At its heart, the Lord's Supper is a very simple thing. It's friends gathering at a table with their Lord, enjoying fellowship together, where hungry hearts find that which satisfies all who trust in Jesus as their Savior and seek his living presence in their lives are welcome here at the Lord's table. Paul wrote, I received from the Lord what I handed on to you, that on the night he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. We lift up our hearts to you, O Lord, for it is good and right for us to give you our thanks and praise. We praise you that you are a God of steadfast love and faithfulness, that you hear us when we cry from the depths. Just as you heard your children when they cried out to you from bondage in Egypt, when you heard the cries of Hannah, the mother of Samuel, of Elijah, Jeremiah, Jonah, your beloved children through, age, through all the ages, through times of suffering and persecution, a famine and warfare. And we praise you that your son Jesus entered into the depths with us and for us, that he rose again and reigns with you in glory where he never forgets or forsakes us. We thank you for the gifts of this table, for the simplicity of bread and wine, and pray that as we share in them, that we might be united by faith with you and with one another, one community living in hope as we watch and wait. For we pray in the name of our living Savior, Jesus. Amen. Our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he'd blessed it, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body that is broken for you. In the same way, our Savior took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink from it, all of you. Let us pray. Merciful God, God of light and hope, lead us forth from this place into the light of your kingdom. No matter the depths of darkness that we may walk through, 
May we go through this day and this week knowing that the dawn will come. Thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.